Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Today's sermon is Daniel, Unseen Conflict, Part 2. Got a Bible, you're going to need it. We've been in the book of Daniel, but don't turn there because we're going to be somewhere else. We we used it last time as a jumping off place to discuss something that was brought up of in the book of Daniel, a, a, dis, a rather disturbing topic, uh, namely... Um, well, namely demons. We looked at angels. We looked at bad angels. Daniel chapter 10 brings us into this, I guess, inside of what's really happening behind the scenes, uh, things that are maybe we didn't want to know. Uh, but believe me, if it's in the Bible, it's something you need to know. And there are things in the Bible that are very disturbing. And yes, you can go to churches. And yes, you can study the Bible in such a way that you come away with nothing but warm fuzzies. You can do that. But it will not be the whole truth. The truth is, sometimes it's fun, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you're happy, sometimes you're not. Sometimes you like what you hear, sometimes you definitely do not like what you hear. But allow the scriptures to confront your life. Allow God to say what he needs to say. He's our father, he's our shepherd, he knows what we need. Uh, we don't need to feel good all the time. We need the truth. And sometimes the truth, truth hurts. And it's when we're, we're lullabied into uh, nothing but good stuff that uh, we run into huge problems because the world is definitely not that way. The reality of the world is, is there is a lot of good out there and there's a whole lot of bad and the bad is super bad. And we were introduced to that last time, this whole angelic conflict, good angels, bad angels. Uh, we also saw last time the beginning, in the beginnings of this that we are the subjects of this battle. So angels are fighting each other, bad and good angels, and we're the subjects of that, of that battle. Did you know that? If you did not know that, you've got a problem because you're, you're missing out on a huge, huge section, a huge slice of scripture. I would, I would definitely, not even a slice, maybe like a quarter of the scriptures you're missing out on. So we saw this entire world, uh, that the entire world, and maybe the most disturbing thing that we learned last time, at least it is for me, maybe not for you. The entire world and every person in it is under the dominion of Satan who is not a Christian. If you're not a Christian, a person who does not know Christ, they are under the dominion of of the evil. And I'm not saying they're evil. I'm not saying they're bad. They may be great people. They may be philanthropic. They may be get, doing a whole lot of stuff. Listen, the Bible puts a, puts a clear line right down the middle and says you're either this or you are that. You're either a son of God, whether you're female or not, you're called a son of God. It's a, it's a status. Back then, sons only, only inherited stuff. And so God wants to make sure that you understand if you're a female, you're getting the same things as the men. Maybe ahead of the men. I don't know. It's a status thing. And so you're either a son of God or you're a son of Satan. The Bible lays it out just like that. You say you don't like that. And I would say, okay, you don't got to like it. But you need to know what it says. It says it very clearly. Uh, the entire world and every person in it is under the dominion of Satan. They are enslaved to him. And as such, they are his possession. Uh, we saw that Acts 26, verse 18. I think that's in your, in your bulletin. Uh, we're not going to look these up. We saw these last time. 1 John 5, 19, we'll see that later. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Like I said, the Bible is replete for this, with this kind of information. It never says anything other than you're either this or you were that. Here's another place, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. It says, we were dead in our trespasses and sins that is outside of Christ, in which, Paul speaking to the Ephesian church, Christians, right? You once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, another name for Satan, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So he's saying you're the sons of obedience because you've obeyed the gospel and you've come to Christ. Everyone who's not done that is what? They're the sons of disobedience. So either you are of the obedience or you are not. There's no, some are obeying and some are not obeying. The rest of us are neutral. Well, it would be great, but it's not like that. You can think that. You can be deluded all you want to. But again, if we're going to sit down and say, what does the Bible have to say about this subject? Then... That's what I'm trying to communicate to you. So again, according to the prince of the power of this air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also all, that's categorical, isn't it? Once conducted ourselves. So we were just like them. All of us were. To be outside of Christ is to be under the thumb of this prince of the power of the air, to be a sons of the disobedience, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, where we were by nature, Children of wrath, just as others. How many others? All the others. All of them. Like I said, this may be disturbing for you. I, as they say, build a bridge because you're going to need to get over it. You really are because that's just simply what it says. And we need to deal with it. We need to hit it straight on. 
So we saw this, that, that not only is there an angelic conflict, but in more recent years, maybe centuries, there's been an escalation in this conflict, namely this, that no longer is it a battle between just angels, the good ones and the bad ones. The Son of God himself, the person of God, in, and the, God himself in the person of his Son, Jesus Christ, has actually invaded this territory of earth in physical form. That is the story of the Bible, and effectively, really the story of the New Testament, but effectively the story of the entire Bible. Jesus has invaded to do specific, very specific things, deliver, rescue, save, redeem, namely rob the devil and his demons of their possession. This is very plain in the scriptures. Again, watch Luke chapter 11. If I cast out demons, Jesus speaking, he's just been accused of casting out demons by the prince of demons is what the Pharisees, because he has a, a, a bigger demon in him, that's how he's able to cast out these smaller demons. That's effectively what they say. He says, okay, if that is so, if I cast out demons nonetheless by that, then Satan's divided against himself. But he says, if I cast out demons, as he says there, by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So in other words, he's saying, how do we know the kingdom of God is among us? Because he's plundering that which has belonged to the kingdom, the domain of Satan up until this time. And that's, that's exactly what he does. When a strong man, speaking of the devil in this case, or a demon, fully armed, notice the way he describes them guards his own house that's the way he describes us human beings who are under the dominion of satan his possessions are undisturbed so every person outside of christ is a possession of satan I'm not saying they're possessed in the strict sense in the in the pejorative sense i'm saying in the sense of they belong either you belong to god or you belong to satan no options out there we're sheep in this world and they are wolves, or they are shepherds. There's either wolves or shepherds out there. There are no options for us. Either one or the other. Like I said, you may not like that. That's okay. I cast out demons by the finger of God, and the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks, speaking of himself, he attacks him and overpowers him, and he takes away from him all of his armor in which he has trusted and divides up his plunder. What is he talking about? He's saying, this is what I'm here to do. I'm taking that which belonged to Satan up to this point, and I'm removing it from his possession. And the only reason why I can do this is because I'm more powerful than him. I have greater authority. It's the Son of God. So we're going to be learning more about this whole issue of demon possession. And I said last time we're going to be talking more in detail of what demon possession is this morning and next Sunday and maybe even the next Sunday. I'm not sure. There's a lot in the Bible has a lot to say about this. It's amazing how much we, little we know about it. We know a whole lot about what, we think we know a lot about what demons say, and yet when we compare it to what the scriptures say, it doesn't agree. Why? Because we're learning our stuff out there. We're not learning our stuff in here. Let us know what the Bible has to say. Let us know everything the Bible has to say, and let us not go beyond what the Bible has to say. Everything you need to know that God, that you need to know, not everything there is to know, but everything there is that you need to know is in the scriptures. So learn it. Let's learn it together. So Luke, are you ready? Now, I said we're not going to be in Daniel. We're using it as a jumping off spot. Turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 4. Luke has a lot to say, as do the other Gospels, but Luke especially has a lot to say. We just saw, uh, there you go, Luke's Jesus speaking about demons and Satan and what he claimed to do here in Luke, chapter 11. Luke, chapter 4, we're going to look at a particular incident where the plunderer, Jesus, comes to take his possessions from our possessions, that which Satan had possessed. So Luke chapter 4, beginning down in verse 31. We're going to be looking at this more closely even next time and what happens here and why the demon does what he does, but we're going to be kind of going over in a cursory way this morning. It says, it came down to Capernaum, the city of Galilee, right, on the, right dead on the uh, Sea of Galilee. You need to go and see it. And he was preaching to them on the Sabbath. That would be a Saturday because that's when they met. They were amazed at his teachings. And his message was with authority. So he's not quoting other people. He's not saying, Rabbi so-and-so said this, and teacher so-and-so. He says, thus saith God. Here it is, right in their face. They were amazed at that. Nobody did that. And there was a man in the synagogue possessed by a spirit. Now, I would suggest to you, this, was, this guy was a regular attender of this church, if you will, this synagogue. But something was different today. The plunderer came to church, and things changed. So the demon outs himself right in front of everybody. He cries out in a loud voice and says, Ha, what do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Nazareth how, have you come to destroy us? Why does he say that? Apparently that Jesus is going to be doing that. 
I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Why would he say that? Why does he lie? Why does he say, I know you're a faker, you're not really the Son of God? Unless he's got a reason to do this because it's undoing something that Jesus had planned, I would suggest to you that's what's going on. Anyway, he comes out and, and notice Jesus shuts him up because he doesn't want him saying that. Even though, isn't it not true that he is the Son of God? So, but there's, there's certain people you want promoting you and other people you don't want promoting you. And a demon is not one you want promoting. So, that's, that's, that's a simple answer. There's a bigger answer. We'll look at it next time. Jesus rebukes him and says, be quiet, come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him down, it says in their midst, he came out of him without doing him any harm. Notice this is not a, this is not a psychosis. This is not a psychoanalysis. This is not some kind of physical problem. This is an actual spirit that was in control of this man. Like I said, you don't like that, just you're going to have to deal with it. This is not a way, it wasn't an Old Testament or, or old way in which they described psychological, physiological problems. Jesus, these are, these are sentient, intelligent, real creatures. And Jesus, deal, they talk, they overpower, they're uh, lucid. With amazement, he throws them down, and they say, with amazement, it came upon them, they discuss, they discussing to one another, verse 36, what is this message? For with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out of him, and the report about him was getting out in every locality in the surrounding, surrounding districts. One of, one of several things for us to take notice of here, uh, the first thing is, is that this is the first miracle recorded in the book of Luke that Jesus performs. There's the miracle of his virgin birth and that kind of stuff, but I mean that actually Jesus performs. The first one recorded in the book of Luke, now we're all theologians, right? Was a theologian, a person who studies God. That's what we all are. We're all. That's why you're in church. If you were not a theologian, then you know you need to be somewhere else because that's kind of what we're doing in here. We want to learn and grow in God, right? Where we're going to find that out about? We're going to find it in the Scriptures. So we're growing and learning of what God has to teach us, and it's confronting our belief system. It's confronting what we've always thought. It's confronting what Mama told us was true, and it's actually turning out to be something different, possibly. I don't know. So we're theologians here together, and so we're going to ask one of the, the a theological question is, why does Luke bring this up as the first miracle of all the miracles? Jesus made other miracles in other places before this, so why does he bring this up as the first miracle of choosing? He can only say certain things. He's got a certain limited space he's going to put in his book, so why does he orchestrate it this way? Well, orchestrate it this way because it's the theme of the whole chapter. If we had time, we could read the whole chapter. We'd see the chapter starts out with Jesus being led in the wilderness after his baptism, tempted by Satan for 40 days. You think, you know, you had an afternoon with Satan and you fell miserably. And Jesus, 40 straight days with no food being tempted by the devil. What was that like? Horrible. But, and then he goes from that temptation straight to his hometown, which is Nazareth. And he goes into the synagogue. This is the previous Saturday, so like seven days before. And he, he says this when he's given the opportunity to speak for himself. If you look there in verse, uh, verse 18 of the same chapter, take a look. So, so the way a synagogue is run is if you have a, a special speaker that comes into town or a person other than your regular cantor, the regular preacher who would be a, a certain person who was respected as a rabbi, you would ask them to come and do the scripture readings. And then they would have a seat. They wouldn't stand up like I'm doing. They would have a seat somewhere in the front. And from a seated position, they would begin to teach the people about what they felt like that scripture says. Jesus goes straight to the book of Isaiah and he picks these, this passage. Look at verse 18. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He's speaking of himself. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives. Captives to what? It's the theme of the whole chapter. Recovery of sight to the blind that set free those who are downtrodden. Free from what? To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, it says, gave it back to the attendant, sat down. All eyes were upon him and the synagogue fixed upon him. And he says, it began today, this scripture has been fulfilled and you're hearing. And then the very next thing is this miracle in which he delivers this man from this evil spirit. Why? Because Luke is aiming you at something. He's trying to show you this is what Jesus came to do. Plunder the one who had possession of all of us. Take away from him that which he owned, that which he controlled. Underneath the boot of Satan, he comes and knocks him off and takes that which belongs to him. It's the theme of the whole chapter. It's the theme of Jesus' entire ministry, as a matter of fact. Uh, we see that in multiple cases. So, so it's, it, it, and, and for instance, as it says right here, 1 John 3, 8, the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. The devil's not some psychological position, not some psychosis, not some force, uh, the dark side. He's not that. He's a real, sentient, 
being, someone you can't see and I would bet you wouldn't want to see. But he's real. Jesus came to destroy his works, and that's the whole movement here of, of Luke, here in, this, in the fourth chapter, and really for the rest of the book of Luke. So, so we have this. So, so first thing we need to see is that this is the first miracle in Luke and, and ask the question why. Second thing we need to see here is we need to, we, we need, we need to ask the question, and maybe we, maybe we haven't, but maybe we really need to ask this question. Where do they find this demon-possessed man? Or I should say, where does, demon, where does Jesus find this demon-possessed man? He's down in the lower part of town, right, in the dark place. You shouldn't go there in the dark, you know, because there's a lot of trouble and stuff. And outside of a strip joint, he comes across this guy, demon-possessed. Isn't that what you think? I mean, if I said, let's go find a demon-possessed person, where would we all go? Right? Isn't that right? It dem- it, 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 and it really is. That's the, it demonstrates the fallacy in the way we think because this guy's in church. In fact, I would suggest to you because he's a local synagogue guy, he's a local Capernaum he lives there. He's a successful individual. Uh, they, had to have, they had to have 20 men in order to form a synagogue. We had a synagogue here on our island. You have, tw- have to have 20 males. I don't care how many females you got. You got to have 20 males, right? I don't know why. Just the way they are. Based upon the male membership. They had to have at least 20 males in Capernaum. He's one of these guys. One of the 20, one of the 40, one of the 80, whatever it was that formed the synagogue. I would suggest to you, I can't prove it. He's there every single Saturday as they read the scriptures, as they explain them. He's a respected person in the community. Why would they let him in there otherwise? If he's some raving lunatic, marching around with half his clothes off, why is he in church? Why is he allowed in there? He's allowed in there because he's none of those things. He's a well-known person, respected person in the community. Again, I can't prove that, but I, I think the consequences of the circumstances here is that strongly speak to that. So this, in, in many ways, assaults our typical view of demon possession. First of all, we think that demon possession is the crazy people out there. Like I said, it's the crazies. Again, we're, we're told by our society, demon possession is the way they used to describe what we now know as psychosis and psychological issues. No, it's not. It's a sentient being controlling a person's faculties and overriding their system and not allowing them to, to, to run their own lives and, and, and ruining them in the process. That's what it is. That's what the Bible over and over again describes it as. But again, we think of these as, as, as crazy people, and there are some in the Bible that are that way. We've got a little boy that's thrown on the ground and foams at the mouth in the New Testament. We've got another guy who's been living naked in the tombs for years. We're going to look at him next time. Possessed by a legion of demons. By the way, a legion is 6,000. We don't know if they're demons, so we don't know if there was actually 6,000. I mean, they're liars anyway. Could have been 600. They just like to lie. But I'm thinking they're probably not lying to the Son of God, nonetheless, just as an aside. Something to think about. But demons don't always cause lunatic behavior. They just don't. They would love for you to think that, though. They would love for you to think you find demons, you're going to have to go to the worst parts of town. Find the worst people. They would love for you to think that, but that's simply not true. It's not biblically true. It's not true just from observability. It's not true from just simple logic. Uh, demons are not like demons would prefer to make you very religious. They can also operate that way. Uh, Jesus describes the Pharisees. We're going to look at the, the verse here in just a minute. He describes the Pharisees as, as a, a generation of people from whom a demon leaves. The demon leaves. It leaves and goes to dry places, it says, and goes back to his own house, speaking of the man, and takes with him seven more demons worse than himself. He says, that's the way this generation is, speaking of the Pharisees. The Pharisees. The Pharisees were the movers and shakers of the day. They were the wealthy. They were the business owners. They were the landowners. They were the politicians. That wouldn't surprise you they're demon possessed, right? That one, definitely. They were not nuts. They were not raving lunatics, foaming at the mouth, rolling down hills, and living in the tombs. They were none of those things. But the demons would love you to think that's demon possession. Demon, Jesus describes these people as not only demon possessed by one, but multiple demons. Who killed Jesus, by the way? You think they weren't demon possessed? It wasn't the guy out in the tombs. It wasn't this guy in the synagogue. It wasn't the little boy demon possessed foaming at the mouth. It was these politicians. It was these religious people. You think they were controlled by demons? Oh, boy. Be careful what your definition of demon possession is. They can make you look very religious, very prosperous. These Pharisees were well-educated. They were wealthy. We saw in the book of Daniel, chapter 10, these demons were behind, it says, the prince of Persia, the prince of Greece. The angel says, I was detained by the prince of Persia for three weeks. So I got a, a sentient being that's controlling a godly angel for three weeks until Michael, the archangel, it says, shows up and delivers him from his possession. 
Isn't that interesting? Isn't that convoluted to some of the things that we think? Behind the, the, the best minds in history were some of these Persian rulers. The best mind, he says, I'm going to leave, the, I'm going to fight the, 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 the king of Persia, and then I'm going to go fight the king of Greece. Who was that? Alexander the Great. One of the most, one of the most brilliant military minds that has ever lived. And yet behind him was a demon? Yeah. Because they're not dumb. They're very smart. They've been around for thousands of years. So, so yeah, he wasn't foaming at the mouth. He was good. Very good. So, so, don't, so don't think, by, by the way, just, just in our own history, and some of us have, have lived, some of us have actually lived through this. Uh, do you not think that Hitler was demon-possessed? I mean, if, you, if you could point to anyone that's lived in the past century and say that person was definitely demon-possessed, couldn't you point at Hitler with, with absolute certainty? Definitely was. You're going to get that answer right on the, on the test for sure. Was he foaming at the mouth? Was he some raven lunatic? Was he not intelligent? Was he not articulate? Was he not influential? Was he not, not uh, uh, charismatic? Was he not powerful? Was he not brilliant? Uh, he was a monster. But was he in all those things? Yeah, and definitely demon-possessed, I would say. So again, we, we think of it as some raven lunatic. We also think of demon possession as some markedly wicked person out there. You know, the Bible says nothing, with the exception maybe of King Saul in the Old Testament, says nothing about the person's moral character who has a demon in the scriptures. In the New Testament, not a single place. Not a single place did we just read anything about this man being an evil person, and that's why he had a demon. That's why I'm suggesting to you he's probably a good guy. That's why he's a part of the synagogue. That's why they let him in. Two different times in the New Testament. Uh, we, we, we've got a guy who has a legion of demons. It says nothing about his moral character. just says he was tormented by these demons. We have, we have two kids in the New Testament possessed by demons. Or the, kid, the kids are the most wicked among us. Isn't that right? No, it is not right. So why were the demon possessed? Because, listen, the possessor can do anything he wants to do with his possessions. It doesn't matter what you do. You can be really bad. You can be, according to human judgment, really good. But when you don't belong to the Savior, you do belong to him, and he can do whatever he wants. Whatever he wants. And that really is the bottom line. It really is. So maybe the thing we need to do is get past this whole issue of putting demon possession in a box. It really can be almost anything. Do not underestimate them. So let's get to the definition of demon possession, and we're going to spend a couple of Sundays doing that. But, but just some, some basic here. Uh, so first of all, everyone who is not, a, again, clearly, everyone who is not a believer is under demonic control. They just are. Again, you, you argue with the scriptures, don't argue with me. First John five nineteen: the whole world lies where? In the power of the evil one. These are categorical statements here. And again, the Greek, the emphasis here in the Greek is literally that they are in his lap. They're like in his lap. Not, not just in the control in the sense that I'm holding on to you and I won't let you do certain things. I'm holding you back. No, they're not even trying to get away. The, 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 again, the force of the Greek is that they're like in his lap. Like they're in the palm of his hands. He's not even having to hold on to them. What kind of control is that? How, how much of the world? The whole thing. Do you believe the scriptures? So possession is, but understand, demon, so everything is, every, the whole world is a possession of Satan. But demon possession in the, in the specific sense is a relatively rare form of dominance in which an unbeliever, mark it carefully, is controlled and they cannot stop it, even if they want to. The demon controls what they do, where they go, what they say, who they are, can, can speak through them, doesn't have to. Can, it's, it's as if your body is hardware and somebody else puts software in there that's running it and you're trapped. You're the other software in there. You can't stop it. They're running their own software. Anybody ever, ever gotten a virus or a Trojan or a whatever they call those things? Some bad stuff. What happens to your computer? Pshh. Because you want it to? No, it's the same hardware. It looks exactly the same. It was the same computer I was working on yesterday, and now I downloaded something I shouldn't have done, and it controls it now, and I can't stop it. That's effectively demon possession with regards to our, our physical bodies. Possession, first of all, like I said, is a, 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 all believe, unbelievers are, the, are under the domination power of Satan. Possession, also number two, is a fluid thing. It's a fluid thing. We send, tend to think of Christianity. We accept Jesus as our personal Savior. The Holy Spirit comes to live in us permanently, never leaves, 
It's the definition of what it means to be a, script, a Christian. One of the definitions is that the Spirit of God lives in you. Demon possession, on the other hand, is a fluid thing, comes and goes. They can be there, they cannot be there. Why can they do that? Because they can do whatever they want with their stuff. They can possess you, they can unpossess you, it makes no difference to them. As an example, the King Saul in the Old Testament, it says on several occasions an evil spirit came upon him and he did something. Evil every time. The evil spirit came upon him and he did such and such. So sometimes the evil spirit was on him and sometimes it wasn't because it's a fluid thing. Happens sometimes and sometimes it does not happen. A third thing, the demon's goal, and maybe the most important thing of all that we're talking about here about demon possession, the demon's goal is to keep people out of the kingdom of God, to keep possessing that which they have possessed for all these years. So their whole goal, all their money, and all their energy is to keep that which is theirs, whatever it takes, whatever the best ploy is. If we're in the military and we're fighting a battle, what is, what is our, our goal in the battle is to win. How do we win? By any means necessary, whatever it takes, espionage, bomb them, gun them, Whatever it takes, right? The goal is to win. So their goal is to keep that which is theirs, even though they have now been invaded by the Son of God, even though they're now fighting not only a battle in that sense, but also against the same angels they've been fighting for, for these millennia. They, 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 may do that, they may do this control. They may do it through an overt control in the classical sense that we understand demon possession, but I would suggest to you that's very rare for them. I don't think that's what they do. They would like for you to think that. But, but you think about it, they, they get a lot more bang for their buck through a thing called not, not possession, but deception. A lot more mileage out of this. This is where I'm going to put my money, my time, and my energies. This is my big guns. Deception. That's where they work. But even if our gospel, Paul says, is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Everybody outside of Christ is perishing. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded. No exceptions to that person who's lost outside of Christ has been blinded by Satan. If they were not blinded by Satan, they would not be in his possession. They would come out. So one of the things we need to pray for a person who does not know Jesus, God, remove the blinders from her eyes. God, help her to see. God, remove the control that Satan has over her life that's teaching her these things. She's blinded. She's deceived. She's led astray. Lest if, and when that does happen, the light of the gospel, it says, the glory of Christ, who is of the image of God, should shine on them. That's their whole goal. But they're, until then, they're deceased, and that's their whole goal. Not possession. Not possession. People say, oh, the, the desire of the demons is to be possessed. How many, how many, let's talk about this for a second. How many truly people manifesting demons have you seen compared to how many deceived people have you seen? No, maybe three in my whole life as a pastor for 25 years. Truly, I could say, and not even sure. I mean, they don't wear a label, I'm demon possessed. I mean, just like, wow, that person's, mm mm, looks like it to me. As compared to deceived people, hundreds of thousands of them. So, where are they putting their main money? You would do, they're not stupid. Why, why control one person when I could control thousands of people, you see? It, 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 it again, just. Simple logic would tell you that that's true. So they're going to they're be emphasizing the teachings, the deceptions, the blindness. That's their primary ploy. Uh, uh, think about it. If, if I'm a demon and my main goal is to keep people out of the kingdom of God, I'm going to major on the things that get me the most bang for my buck. And so what am I going to do? Am I going to be messing with some, some homeless person underneath the causeway over here? By the way, that would be in the water. That probably wouldn't be homeless very long. Underneath the, underneath the bridge somewhere. Would I be messing with a person like that? I'm not saying they can't be demon-possessed, but that's typically our idea. Oh, it's this guy living in a cardboard shack underneath a, a, a bridge somewhere. Maybe he is demon-possessed. I don't really know. But if I'm a demon, I'm think, or if I'm a person, I'm thinking that's a stupid demon doing that. I'm going to be going after people who can get me a lot more mileage. Heads of state, power brokers, government officials, religious teachers, seminary teachers. That, that's who I'm aiming at. Why, why would I waste my time with this guy? So he, I, I, I possess him. He turns into this raven lunatic, and that's going to convert who to my way? Who's going to follow that? Oh, I want to be just like him, live underneath the bridge, foam with the mouth. They would love for you to think that they're that stupid. They're not. They're definitely, definitely not. They're going to go after especially teachers. 
I mean, look, look at the, the creators of false religions that we have around in the world today, throughout the world. These guys, with, with almost no exception, as their testimony of why they had to recreate the scriptures, they wrote their own Bibles or their own testimonies or whatever, and why they have to dominate and control people, their testimony always begins with some story of an experience they had with some angelic being in which they received these texts and these documents. And of course, we're wondering, well, was that a good angel or was that a bad angel? I'm thinking bad. Definitely bad because they do the same thing that the devil did in the Garden of Eden. They, they call into question the scriptures and they call into question the character of God. And any time and every time you see that, you know you're dealing with a demon or Satan himself. Notice, it's his ploy. He's not giving up on it because it works. The serpent says to the woman, you will not surely die. What did God say? The exact opposite. In the day you eat of it, you will die. They did spiritually die. You will surely not die, lies to her. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good. What is he saying? God's holding out on you, sister. God's not as good as you thought he was. He, there's good stuff out there for you and God's holding you back. He's not telling you the truth and he himself is not truthful. And that is the characteristic of every single false teacher. Why? Because they're, they're demonically controlled. They speak just like the servant because that's who's behind them. That's where their stuff comes from. They call into question the word of God and the character of God and they want to find an exception to that. So again, we think of demon possession as some lunatic foaming at the mouth. <sighs> Who would want to be that? Again, my goal is to keep my possessions. And so my way to convince people to stay in the kingdom of Satan and not go into the kingdom of God is to roll the person I control on the floor and have him foam at the mouth, have him scream and holler. Who would want to follow that? You know, yay, I want to get on that. I want to join whatever church he's a part of because that's awesome. No. They would love for you to think they're that stupid. They're definitely not. Again, we should expect, therefore, the majority of demon possession to look like this. Literate. Articulate. Convincing. Religious. Seemingly sound and well thought out arguments. We should expect all those things. Not somebody foaming at the mouth. I, not to say that they can't do that. But let's not put it in a box. So let's, let's we, we've... Um, we need to spend our final time here looking at something, another question I think is more important than what is demon possession. Answer the question, can Christians be demon possessed? See, that's a big question. I hear that all the time. Can Christians be demon, it's scary stuff. So these sentient evil beings that have nothing but evil in all that they are and all that they, can they control Christians? And the short answer is no, that is the truth. But I will tell you something, Pastor Bill said it's not true, so it must not be true. That'll not get you through a dark night, not even half the night. What will get you through the night is if I can prove what I say from the Scripture. So then you can say, I know it because the Word of God shows us. So here's a couple of places, not more than a couple. Acts chapter 26, verse 17 and 18. We saw this last time. Paul's call to the ministry, he's recounting it here. Telling him what, what Jesus said to him as he called to the ministry. He called Paul to open their eyes, he told Paul, so that they may turn from darkness to light. We're familiar with that, that, that idea, right? From, notice, the dominion of Satan to the dominion of God. So you're in one dominion. you got to leave that dominion and go to the dominion of God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins. So you tell me you've been forgiven of your sins, but you think you're still in the dominion of Satan? Uh-uh. Nope. Part and parcel of you being forgiven is him removing you, forgiving you, removing you sovereignly into another dominion. So you're not in the dominion of Satan. He has no control over you. He has no say over you, even though it may seem like he does. He'd love to lie, lie to you, love to you think, but it's not true. So, so, so it's, a, it's a dominion change. Can't be possessed. I've lost, left that dominion. 2 Corinthians 6, 15 and 16 says, or what harmony... Has Christ with Belial? Belial is another name for Satan. Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? You say, well, I work with unbelievers all the time. We've got a lot in common. No, not in some respects, yes, but not in what he's about to say. Or what agreement has the temple of God with that of idols? So a person who is saved, the great definition of a saved person, for it says we are the temple of God, the living God. So a great definition of what it means to be a Christian is that a Christian is a person in whom God dwells. They are the temple of God, right? 
biblically. So a person who is not saved is what? The temple of what? Yeah, idols. So, so you're either a temple of God or you're a temple of demons. You're either a place where God lives or you're a place where a demon can live anytime he wants to. You can stop over, you can call yourself a hostel, a hospital, a hotel, but it's for demons only. By the way, do you think those same demons are going to go find themselves in a house that belongs to God? Again, don't mix up, we call this place the house of God. We're talking about martyr and brick. We're talking about physical bodies in whom spirits dwell. The spirit of God dwells in you. You think a demon's going to find himself in a place like that? No. No way. Jesus steps into a brick and mortar place called a synagogue in Capernaum. And as soon as he steps in there and starts saying anything, this guy who'd probably been there every single Saturday starts saying, oh, 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 what are you doing in here? I know who you are, the Holy One of God, and Jesus got to shut him up. Why? Because, man, he can't be in the presence of that kind of stuff. Scared to death of that kind of stuff for all the right reasons. So why would a demon come and live inside of a body who is possessed by the living God? It doesn't make sense. Not at all. We saw this one last time in Matthew chapter 12. Now, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, now Jesus just says that as if we all know that that can happen. Like I said, it is a fluid thing. We get our understanding of demons from the scripture, so apparently they can leave anytime they want to. Why? Because they can do whatever they want to with the stuff that's theirs. Then it says, because why? They're sentient, intelligent beings. I will return to my house. What is he talking about? He doesn't live in a, in a brick and mortar house. He lives in a physical house called a human body. I will return back to the guy I left, if you will, and when it comes, he finds it unoccupied, so the house is empty. So, so a person outside of Christ is an empty shell? No, they live there. Me, I'm living inside my body. I don't know about you. Some people don't think they are. But I'm, I'm a human spirit living inside of a physical body, and I have control over that. But if a demon decides he wants to come in, and I don't have another resident in there, namely the Son of God, I got myself some problems. He can just do whatever he wants. And that's what he does. In fact, not only does he go back in, it says, he takes along with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and the condition of that man is worse than it ever was beforehand. Because, so think of yourself as a physical, as, 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 this, as this temple of God. God resides in me. He's a permanent resident. So a demon's going to come knock on the door and say, God, I want to live in the back room. No. Definitely, definitely not. Christians cannot be demon-possessed. Christians, though, definitely can be demonically influenced. And let me just say this to you very clear. Everybody wake up for just a second. Come on, I know. It's tough, I know. I'm about to fall asleep myself. Hear me carefully. All Christians, all Christians are demonically influenced. There aren't any exceptions to that. All Christians are being lied to. All Christians are being led astray. All Christians are being tempted at the area of, or, of, the area of weakness. Why? Because they're after you. They're, they, they can't do anything about you because now you're in the kingdom of God, but they can stop you from doing anything out there that would change their possession level. They don't want to keep what their stuff is, and you're the one with the message of power to stop them in that, and they want to restrict that as best they can, and so they are coming at you. There's a, there, all Christians are demonically influenced. Well, I'm not demonically influenced. Well, then I would like to come and live with you. I don't know what kind of bubble you live in, but it must be awesome where you live. Because in my house, we're demonically influenced. We've got to fight it all the time. I would love for there to be a place where there was no demonic influence. As I understand it, that's heaven, and this isn't it. So I would, if you've got heaven at your house, man, I can, I'll pay rent, whatever I can do. I'd love to come over there. They're always trying to get at us, always, but be certain of this. Satan and his demons have nothing on us, nothing in us. 1 John 4, 4. You are from God, little children. You have overcome them, not will but half. Again, you got these televangelists saying we've got to overcome the demons and all this stuff. No, it's already been done. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. It's an absolute. He has nothing in us. Go, go back. I know we ran around a lot here. Go back to chapter 4 of Luke. I don't want to just look. Just one, one more time here at what this guy with the demon says. I think it's instructive. I think it's important for us. And we're going we're gonna to end up with this. Luke, Luke chapter 4, look at verse 30, 35. I'm sorry, verse 34. So Jesus walks in, starts preaching the same thing he's been preaching in all the other synagogues. God has anointed me to, relieve, to proclaim release to the captives. And sure enough, here's the captive in this, in this synagogue, in this worship service. 
So the demon shouts through this man's voice, Ha, what, what do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Why does he say that? Because apparently Jesus can do that. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Well, that's very interesting. I said earlier we're theologians, right? So all those pseudo-theologians in this synagogue, place is packed. We're not saying this. These pseudo-theologians are not really sure, even after it all takes place, who is this? Speaking with authority and casting out demons. They're not even sure who he is. The demons is absolutely certain who he is. He knows exactly. I know you're the son of God. I know exactly who you are. It's very interesting how theologically sound this demon is. I would suggest to you they all are. They all know the story. They all know his power. They all know how it's going to end. They all read the Bible. They are, I would suggest to you, the demons are some of the most fundamentalists among us. Indeed. They have to know it. They have to. It's their bread and butter. So again, back to, the, back to uh, uh, I think, a very important question. Where does Jesus dwell today? On earth, Jesus is dwelling where? So, so when he says to us, all authority has been given me in heaven and earth, therefore go and make disciples. So with what kind of backing do we have with that? Complete authority, you see. Complete authority. Not going around binding and cursing and doing all I mean, you deal with demons as they come up. No, preaching the gospel, the truth, which is what? Which releases people. It's the power of God unto salvation. It translates them from the domain of darkness and to the domain of light and all our bindings and cursings and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not saying necessarily we shouldn't ever do it. I'm just saying it shouldn't be the mainstay because it's not the mainstay of Scripture. Scripture says preach the gospel. Let the chips fall where they may. God will weed them out. God will straighten them up. How did God find you? Yeah, you have no idea. Me neither. I'm just thinking, God, just how, how good he was to reach out and find me because I definitely was not looking for him. There are a lot of people not looking for him. They're just as deceived as they can possibly be. They don't want to hear anything about God. If anything, they want to go the opposite way. But God is reaching them through us. God is teaching them through us. God is delivering them through us as we're responsible, responsible to carry his word to them changes them. So Jesus just starts speaking in the synagogue and this demon just outs himself. Why? We're going to see that next time. We'll find out. I'm going to ask you, would pow your heads and close your eyes with me as we come to conclusion this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you have commissioned us to be the bearers of truth in a world that is anything but the truth. In a world that is dark, we're bearers of light. In a world that is rotten, we're the salt. You didn't say we just have, we don't just have the salt, we don't just have the light. We are the salt. We are the light. You've left us here with your spirit so that everywhere we go, also there goes God. There goes God living inside that person who has surrendered themselves to him. God, I pray that as we speak to those we love this week, we remember that is all of God living in us and the authority of God that's with us. As we go to our coworkers, as we go to our friends, we would remember that it's all of God living in us and all of God that's given us this commission and this authority and power to do the things you called us to do. God, I pray for great courage. I pray for great, great heart for a world, God. We've forgotten what it's like to be under the dominion, under the boot, under the control of that which is completely, utterly evil. Thank you, God, for taking us out of it. Help us, God, to look back with great compassion to those who aren't out yet. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptist.org.